looking at a global energy mix that fit, a global energy mix that fits in a green economy. Principles of a green economy that we're following, as released by UNEP recently, it's basically one that results in important human improved human well-being, uh, social equity, while significantly reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. So we're working within that general frame: resources for real prosperity, rather than what's kind of going on in different areas on economic growth. So again, this is not about what you can't do, it's what you can do. So see this as a very positive, how we're gonna use different energy sources to feed the demand and the needs of tomorrow. <clears throat> so the key project deliverables are basically in, in three columns. So we've been working originally with the web portal design for the project people and the, and, the, and the scientists in the community. Now, of course, we're soon gonna release and hopefully I'll have time to show you some highlights, an outreach portal which is designed much more for the public and getting an, an engagement and a discussion going on on, on what are these hydrates and et cetera. Uh, we're also providing an ebook, and that's a, a much more interactive way of providing this information, including an audio, video, interviews, links, et cetera. Uh, the more you want to know about it, the more you can dig deeper into the subject matter. Uh, and then finally, the print edition, which is uh, of course required by, by all the organizations. So we're looking at right now a two volume approach, which I'll expand upon in a few minutes. And of course, focus this on very visual. We aim for at least 60%, 50% visual, so graphs uh, that, are, uh, that can depict the concept, pictures, etc. So we want to rely less on the text and much more on the visual impact. And the mainstream language, of course, rather than technical language. So some of our project milestones to date as of July 2011. So the status of the publication. We have eight core chapters that are now in hand, contributions from over 25 international experts, and more to be added. Uh, external reviews for three chapters are underway. Internal reviews for the six should be completed soon. Uh, content editing by the fall. Graphics and layout in December 2011 to February 2012. Final review next March, and then full launch May, June uh, 2012. Hopefully again in time with uh, some of the, the key conferences coming up. Uh, some of the international profiling and awareness raising has been done so far. So profiled uh, on an expert panel at 2011 World Energy Cong Congress, which was uh, an extremely good learning experience as well. Uh, profiled at the fall 2009 AGU, uh, 2010 EGU, 2010 Ocean 5 Conference on, on Hydrates in Russia, uh, Malik Nankai Symposium last fall, here today with you, and also to be profiled at the upcoming European Unconventional Gas Symposium as a, as a guest and keynote speaker. Uh, also looking at proposed events at the next UNFCCC uh, climate change meeting in Durban, also at the Rio Plus 20 uh, sustainable development, and we're also looking at different uh, partnerships for the launches within the community that we're working with as well. So on the public outreach, I'm not going to go necessarily into full detail on all this, but I guess uh, uh, for, at the first public uh, website that was released last year, we have a new one that is now redesigned explicitly for uh, uh, the general public in this case. We have popul started populating Wikipedia with actually a lot of the research sites. The benefit of this is that the researchers over time, even once this project is done, can keep updating and adding new content as new research comes out for their own sites. Uh, we're also in camp uh, collaboration with the production company, Camera Lucida, which uh, you might have seen running around here, and they're doing a 90-minute documentary on methane gas hydrates uh, for international broadcast. We're in discussion also with National Geographic to profile the UNEP project in their 2012 methane special edition. So, table of contents, just to bring, bring it down uh, very in, in summary fashion, let's say. I'm not again going to go through all that, but like you said, we're like I was telling you <coughs> earlier, we're dividing this into mainly two kind of scopes. One is the natural systems, and one is the human systems. So, uh, anything from going from what are these methane gas hydrates all the way to technology, societal perspectives, world energy outlook, uh, assessments, etc. So, pretty broad scope, but again, all based on the work you guys are all doing. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on the technical, technical part since you guys pretty much wrote the book on this. So what I'll focus on for the next few slides on the content highlights is mainly a little bit of the stuff maybe you're not so familiar with and a lot of the work we have to do to engage with policymakers. So a little bit more on the societal perspectives and, and how to influence the discussion dialogue. So we call this the ooh-ah slide. I'm sure you've all seen this graph before. 53% of organic carbon and hydrates and people will just go <gasps> Of course, the big question is how much of that, in a context of potential energy, could be recoverable. Now, we all know a lot smaller, but at least get this kind of slide gets the discussion going. People take, uh, they, you know, they have an attention when they see this. 
So we also, of course, take a look and focus a lot on, on what's going on in the Arctic. So again, doing some assessments, gathering information and providing that on, on what the current assessments have been, the, the recent releases and estimates when it comes to potential recoverable resources. And our other interest is all the offshore environment. And I, I saw, I took some of these notes from the presentation on the first day uh, with some of the, uh, the numbers that were coming out of Japan as an estimate as well. So again, all to provide a context. And this is not, again, new information. It's all based on what the work is going on, what, what you guys are all working on right now. Now, when we take all this and frame it, of course, this all has to go into something that can be used by policymakers. So basically, that, that need and the benefits of sound policymaking. And again, it's not about the can't do's. What we want to do is focus on the positive and the challenges, making a lot of countries realize that this is an opportunity, and not just an opportunity for economic gain, but an opportunity for national planning and, and expanding a different sector. So not the silo thinking, but really thinking outside the box and looking at this integrally. So why some of the work that we're doing, some of the questions we're putting into this work, so why you know, socioeconomic <laughs> considerations when you're looking at hydrate, or any kind of resource for that matter? Well, you want to make sure as a policymaker that you account for most possible costs and benefits. Uh, those can be market and non-market, social and environmental. You want to set proper expectations. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to set the bar too low, set the bar too high. You want to be right there in that right spot, that sweet spot. How much wealth do you need and over how long a time period? So basically how the rate at which you want to generate your income and your revenue. Uh, sustainability of benefits rather than sustainability of the activity. So that's one thing as a policymaker. And working for financial prosperity or societal prosperity and well-being. So what are you trying to do? What are you, what's your ultimate goal? You want to determine proper levels of public investment. Again, some of these things can be very expensive. How are you going to do, how are you going to do this? How are you going to get it to commercialization? But also, what does that mean as uh, you know, working with, with public money? You want to examine all options of fiscal management. So there's not just the very t traditional direct taxation mm -hmm. methods. There's all kinds of things out there. Norway uses one scheme. The Alaska Trust is another. So again, the list goes on. And these can all fit very well for different countries using different fiscal tools. And take your time and plan for you know, keeping sight ahead of desired outcomes. I mean, we've got a lot of resources. We're doing a lot of collaborative work in West Africa right now. And a lot of the, the different groups working with the governments are simply saying, well, the longer it's down there, the more it's worth. So why rush? And they got a point. So some of these countries are now realizing they can slow down and develop at a, at a pace that's actually in tune with the development plans and goals of their country. And understand and consider a variety of possible futures. So when we're doing this kind of work, one thing you have to do is you can't just provide policymakers with a bunch of data. It's pretty rare that somebody makes decisions based on pure data. They need to have a context and a narrative. And one way to do that is future scenarios work. Now these aren't meant to predict a future. They're simply meant to do, based on the information at hand today, what are the possible trends that might happen in decision making in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Companies do this all the time. So of course the expectation is policymakers do the same. So in this case, what we've done is we've picked three kind of you know, feasible, nothing too radical, and they're not suggestive in saying that this may happen and this will be the likely future. It has nothing to do with that. But it provides a context for where hydrates might fit in in a 2025 scenario. So one of those could be a low carbon society, what we call. And that, you know, what, what basically does that look like? Well, high carbon price, you know, means the phase out of oil, that, well, almost all hydrocarbons before hydrates becomes viable. That's a possibility. Investment in efficiency, renewables, demand management, decentralized energy system, some payment for non-exploitation of hydrate could be an option. Uh, there's also room for some local extraction and consumption of hydrates, example in the Arctic and West Africa. So again, these, these could, this could also fit in there. Uh, what kind of world? Well, probably a low consumption world, uh, low growth prosperity, strong civil society. So that's a possible trend. And how does hydrate fit into all that? Another scenario could be a gas transition scenario. And that's a lot of what UNEP's kind of operating on right now and working with, and so is the IEA as well, is possibilities of looking at, at gas as a transitional energy source towards a decarbonized energy grid. So you might have a phase out of coal and oil. Investment in gas means infrastructure, skills, political culture favor the exploitation of hydrate. Natural gas, a transition energy source underpinning the global energy mix. Centralized energy systems, electrification of transport. The hydrates are more viable if they supply a reservoir for carbon sequestration as well. So this could be still a high consumption world. 
environmental externalities, water, climate, biodiversity still exist, but maybe in, in a less extreme fashion, some of the internalities of, of, that's brought into the system. Carbon price mid-level, with at least some level of reliable enforcement. So that could be you know, a pretty viable scenario based on the current trends. And also, based on current trends, you could get something like a protectionist uh, world scenario. Methane hydrate is a critical resource for some countries. Uh, less technical sharing, less capital investment, risks are mag magnified. Focuses a lot on national, uh, national energy security. Carbon reduction is actually a low priority. Few global, uh, global agreements, and there may be some resource conflict and instability. None of these are, of course, meant to scare or, or be uh, pointing to possible you know, futures or, or you know, don't do this, don't do that. It, you need a narrative, you need a context to put the discussion in. And this, these are the kinds of scenarios that are used often by governments to explore how they're going to plan and invest into the future. And they're all based on actual trends and data that are itemized. And some of the themes you see here today from the future of globalization, scarcity issues, technological issues, energy transitions, so these are all data that are available in our model, basically, to provide these kinds of scenarios. So that's one tool we're looking at. Uh, and I think I have a few more minutes, so I'm actually going to just give you a brief highlight of some of the public outreach work that we've been doing, which includes the new web portal, which we're still working on, and we're going to discuss this Friday as well. But just to give you an idea that a lot of the times when you're engaging with the public, of course, the one thing you've got to do is the least amount of, of upfront information is better the attention span that somebody who's not necessarily versed in gas hydrates or anything technical is pretty limited. But then as they get interested, they want to get into things so they can dig and look and get more information. Uh, basically, some of the features, uh, including uh, video library, um, you know, video gallery, photo libraries, all of you are always invited to contact us if you want to submit things. Credits are all put in there. Um, we prefer high res and, and, and making sure that people can actually download and use this. Uh, with proper accreditation. So again, we want to build this up and it's all dependent on the community. We've also uh, started developing a beta of a, of a global geospatial database for all the, uh, the sites that you're all working on. Uh, now again, this is not meant to be highly technical and, and full of, of quantitative data, but it's meant to inform and give a storyline. Uh, and right now we've populated with about 42 sites as you see around the world. And again, you can click on this and get more information. Uh, it's also going to be linked to the wiki pages. And we've uh, made a video version of, a, of an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. So instead of, again, having to read this, you get to interact a little bit with the actual scientists that are working on this. Uh, and again, if uh, any of you want to contribute to this, there's always options and you can contact us. Thank you very much. Could you please uh, tell us a little bit more about your activities around the Arctic area? Yeah, so again, I mean, we don't do particularly activities. What we're doing is we're set up as a steering committee of experts that lead the different uh, thematic areas we're pursuing. So they're gathering the information from the sources themselves, the people working on this. So uh, again, the, the themes are not necessarily focused on specific sites, just areas and a general overview of the work that's been done. Uh, assessing the possibilities of what the hydrates, you know, occurrences of hydrates in the Arctic. Um, so I'm not sure if you're, you have something specific that you're referring to, or? Uh, does it mean basically send the scientists and researchers uh, going there and coming back to report to you? You may just make summaries based on their data? Uh, yeah, no, no one's reporting to us at all. We're, we're basically, again, they're, uh, they're gathering the published information, basically. So it is a synthesis exercise. So we don't have anybody doing field work for us because it's already based on field work being done by the national projects. Yeah. And I'm asking because I'm going to solve about this uh, next month's uh, solid satellite. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe that could be something related in, in this uh, geology and geophysics. Maybe it was with the, uh, the resource uh, exploration in the future. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, and we are building case studies around some of the sites, including Nankai, Trop, and, and, and the Malik site and others, where we have basically examples of what the progress is as well on, on, on those activities, so yeah. That's very interesting, thank you very much. Okay, okay thank you, Dr. Dippedoyne. Our next presentation is entitled, Heat Transfer Analysis of Regasification of packed bed of hydrate. And the presenter is Dr. Susumu Tanaka. Thank you, Kimwa. Good morning. Uh, I am honored and happy to receive the opportunity to make this presentation here. As uh, many of you already know, the natural gas hydrate supply chain has been uh, proposed and uh, developed in this decade. This supply chain consists of uh, hydrate production from gas, uh, shipping, storage, and regasification processes. In my presentation today, I will focus on the, this uh, regasification process. My contents are as shown here.